Good morning, um, everybody. Uh, we'll now get started. So, um, yes, welcome to um, this latest BDB Pittman seminar in our port series. Uh, and this one is on the decarbonisation uh, of ports um, and vessels. Um, and uh, uh, I, sh I should introduce myself. I I'm uh, Richard Marsh. I'm a partner in, in the BDB Pittman's planning and inf infrastructure team. Um, and our team focuses on the planning and development of major inf infrastructure projects. And that includes ports, roads, airports, uh, energy generation, transmission. Um, and with an office in Southampton, we are uh, particularly focused on port developments um, on the south coast. And today we'll be hearing from uh, uh, from individuals from Portsmouth Port and uh, Red Funnel uh, Ferries. Um, so we'll be covering issues around uh, the decarbonisation decarbonisation of ports, which is um, uh, uh, an issue that is uh, very much on the on the international agenda. Um, and that's going to include a dive into the world of uh, vessel technology, uh, shore power, um, electrification, electrification of plants and machinery, uh, efficiencies and, and standards. And um, we're going to be hearing from a, a stellar group of panellists. Uh, that includes the, uh, the BPA, British Port Association, uh, Royal Haskoning, uh, Red Funnel, uh, Portsmouth Port and, uh, and Vattenfall Network Solutions. Um, so this morning there'll be roughly uh, 40 minutes of, of talking from our, our panellists and then the remainder of the session will be Q&A. Um, I'd expect us to finish at around 10, 10.35, 10, 10, 10.40. Um, and in terms of questions, once um, I mean during the, uh, the, the panellist session, please do submit your questions uh, on the Q&A uh, function. So you should be able to see that at the bottom of your page. Um, and you've got the option to, to ask uh, questions uh, an anonymously, um, if you so wish. Uh, in terms of technical issues, please use the chat function, again, which you sh should see at the bottom, bottom of the page. And my colleague, Melissa, will, uh, should be able to help you with, with any technical issues you're, you're facing. Uh, so, as I'm sure uh, everyone knows, the, the UK is now committed to reducing its carbon emissions to net zero by 2050, uh, and that is to be consistent with the, uh, the Paris Agreement goal, and that's to limit uh, global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius, uh, and ideally uh, to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, just last week, uh, Boris, when he, when he wasn't worrying about the chatty rat so much, um, confirmed that the government would legislate to introduce a further a carbon reduction target, and that would be to reduce national, national emissions by 78% by 2035. So again, uh, a very tough, tough target and um, uh, very much leading uh, uh, the global, global nations in terms of um, uh, limiting uh, the effects of, of uh, carbon emissions and, and climate change. Um, and that is very much to uh, adopt the adv advice that's been given by the Independent uh, Climate Change Committee. Uh, on their sixth uh, carbon budget. Uh, so notable um, inclusion within the sixth, sixth carbon budget that's been adopted uh, by the government and, and should be legislated by the end of June uh, is that the UK share, share of international um, shipping emissions, as so in not just territorial emissions should be included. Um, and that, that is hoped, uh, it's hoped that it will allow national emissions to be accounted for accurately and consistently, which hasn't been done so to date. Um, now, in terms of international emissions, that, that, uh, there's potential for that to impact on the consenting of major uh, port infrastructure, um, because there will be a need to demonstrate um, that any new development or, or redevelopment of a port uh, and the co consequential uh, impact on, on carbon emissions uh, will not prejudice the, the UK's ability to meet carbon reduction targets. So clearly there is a, a major and urgent need for ports and port users to start or continue uh, decarbonising their, their operations uh, ASAP. Uh, now the, 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 there have been some uh, positive uh, steps by, by government in terms of incentivisation uh, an investment, but they are relatively modest. So, for example, in March, there was an announcement that there would be a £20 million investment to help uh, innovative zero emission vessels and clean port uh, infrastructure to come forward. Uh, but is £20 million uh, enough um, uh, when set against the, uh, the, the amount we've spent on, on the COVID pan pandemic, for example? Uh, and then also uh, last week, uh, the International Chamber of Shipping uh, called for a global tax uh, on carbon emissions, so a carbon tax 
uh, to encourage investment in new technologies. So I'm sure we'll come on to um, those points in particular during the session. Uh, so what are the options available to ports and, and port users and what are the issues surrounding their implementation? Uh, we're going to seek to deal with, with those, uh, those points during this session. It's just a, a, an hour webinar. We could clearly spend probably 10, 10 days or more um, on an on enormous conference to deal with the, all the issues, but this is really um, uh, 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 a, a dive into, into some of the issues and will really give a flavour of uh, the issues facing ports, port users uh, and those advising um, uh, those parties. So without further ado, I will now introduce our first speaker, uh, and that is Mark Simmons. He's the Director of Policy and External Affairs at, uh, at the BPA. Uh, BPA is um, the key trade association for ports, terminals and port facilities. And um, I think at the last count had, had over 400 members. Uh, and Mark's been with the BPA for, for nearly five uh, years now. So I will now pass over to Mark. Um, and the head slide should be there, Mark. So um, uh, off you go. Thank you, Richard. And uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as Richard said, I'm Mark Simmons from the British Ports Association, a trade association representing uh, um, 100 port members who collectively own and operate over 400 uh, ports, terminals and facilities uh, across the UK. Um, I'm going to talk uh, quite briefly about some of the work uh, ports are doing already, uh, some of the barriers um, that we're facing and uh, some of the ways we think uh, those barriers might be overcome. Uh, although, as Richard said, um, this could be a 10 day conference, so uh, be breezing through it all uh, pretty quickly. Um, next slide, please, Melissa. Thank you. Um, so just to start, um, I have to include the usual caveat uh, whenever we speak about anything that all ports are all very different in the UK, that they're almost almost everyone is is uh, unique um, in a way that they're all very different sizes, uh, different types of um, vessels and cargoes calling in and passing through them, um, different types of equipment that need um, to be decarbonized and so on. Um, and importantly, different levels of uh, vertical integration. So you often have, um, in some ports, you will have the port authority that uh, is also a terminal operator and in other places, um, it's uh, purely a conservancy and pilotage authority, meaning that they, different ports will have different levers that they can pull and different levels of control over the various emissions uh, within their harbours. Um, and on top of that, they're, they're all at, um, as you would expect, different stages in, in their journeys towards um, decarbonisation. Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll talk about some of the barriers in, in the next slide, but they're not always universal. Um, and some ports have, uh, have found ways around some of those barriers. Um, so, so there's always an exception to, to whatever I'm, I'm talking about. Um, and and you'll, you'll hear shortly from uh, Portsmouth Port, Port, for example, who have uh, got lots of really impressive um, work going on. Um, I, I don't have time to, to cover all of the stuff that, that Port's doing, so um, I've put a link in there. Please take a look at some of the examples we've collected. Um, that was published um, last year now, early last year. And um, one thing at the moment I've noticed is the incredible pace of change in, in the port sector in the UK. So things are moving really quickly, and um, I think we're going to um, get a bit of an update out on, on the, those case studies and examples of, of all the things ports are doing uh, in, in the next few months. And, uh, and then in future, perhaps develop that into a bit more of a comprehensive um, program of, of knowledge sharing. But the, the link's there, and I'll drop it into the chat um, a bit later as well. So uh, please do take a look. But there's, um, there's already loads going on. Um, some ports are, are installing shore power in, in Orkney and Southampton, for example. Uh, there's also smaller schemes for lots of um, smaller shore power schemes for fishing vessels. Um, there's an incredible amount of work going on around energy efficiency and uh, making, uh, you know, reducing the amounts of uh, fuel ports are using in, in their own equipment. Um, there's a lot of effort around incre increasing port optimization as well to, um, uh, to, to lower vessel emissions when they're manoeuvring and, and coming into port too. Um, there's also investment in hybrid vessels, pilot vessels, for example, in, in London and, and Orkney. Um, and and we've, we're starting to see more and more electric uh, investment in electric equipment um, and hybrid, hybrid gear as well. Um, although, as I'll mention in a minute, there's still some uh, significant challenges uh, around that. Um, 
So I think, yes, we'll go on to the next slide, please, uh, Melissa, and I'll talk about some of the, the barriers. Um, so, so what are the barriers? Um, well, this is not an exhaustive list, and uh, lots of these things will ov overlap. Um, by market barriers, I really mean two things. There's, um, um, I'm trying to cover off the port's role in decarbonising shipping uh, as one, uh, where there's, uh, there's obviously a level of uncertainty around uh, what the demand might be for zero carbon fuels. And um, it, it's difficult to talk about decarbonizing ports without decarbonizing uh, the main source of emissions within those ports, which is um, ships. Um, and so there, there's a huge level of uncertainty um, around where that's going. Um, but there's also um, barriers within the market for decarbonizing port equipment itself. Um, port equipment is, is usually highly specialized. Um, um, reach stackers and other um, uh, cargo handling equipment, for example, or, um, uh, or where it's not you know, forklifts and, and the more general stuff, ports tend to use the, um, tend to be buying at the, um, the higher ends of the technical specifications. So they're looking for the heavier gear um, where the electrification hasn't um, necessarily proceeded as quickly as we would like. So, um, so where there are uh, electric alternatives for uh, much port equipment, there's um, huge costs involved. The cost is, and um, and more broadly, the business case is is usually um, a big barrier. Um, so I'm not saying you can't buy an electric uh, reach stacker or loader, for example, but um, they will generally cost uh, a lot more, um, and um, we're told quite often less productive. You might have to plug them in, or they might need a, a wire trailing. Uh, which makes it a lot harder for terminals to adopt when um, when, uh, when when you're telling them that they might affect their productivity and, and how quickly uh, cargo is, is going to move through uh, a terminal. So um, st still some challenges for um, electric and hybrid gear to keep up with uh, the diesel counterparts. Um, we'll see how uh, the government's um, changes to the uh, um, rebates for diesel, we'll, we'll see if that um, it moves, moves the innovation and, and pace of uh, adoption along. Um, I suspect it might not, but um, I, I won't dwell on that as I've only got five minutes. Um, just to talk briefly about shore power, as, as that always comes up, and that, that's a, a huge interest at the moment. Um, we did, a, again, I'll drop this in the chat, we, we did a report last year um, into shore power and, and examining the barriers around that specifically. Um, we found that the three biggest barriers to, to the installation of shore power were uh, huge capital costs, um, both within the port and, um, and often uh, the need for um, capital or in investment in, in the energy network outside the port gate. Um, so the, the costs of these sorts of schemes can, it, it varies wildly, but it can, it can run into, into millions and millions of pounds, especially if upgrades are needed on, on the network. Um, another big barrier was the price of electricity in this country, and that will, um, that's a broader issue for decarbonisation as electrification is, is often going to be um, the alternative. Um, the the pro price of electricity is too high in this country, uh, and it is not competitive um, when, when you're comparing it to um, ships burning uh, marine fuel. Um, and then finally, uh, we found with shore power, there was a, um, a lack of consistent demand um, from port to port. Um, this, this varies, but overall, there, there wasn't enough demand to make uh, the business case stack up in, in most ports. Um, that said, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's been a lot of change over the last year. I, I know a lot of ports are, are, are looking very carefully at shore power at the moment. Um, but those, those capital costs probably remain um, a, a huge barrier um, to, to widespread um, adoption. And um, before I move on to just talk briefly about some of the barriers, um, I'll just mention the, the energy networks. Um, as I've said, electrification is going to be key to so much of, um, of this decarbonisation work, whether it's shore power or battery charging or electrolysis for zero emission fuels, for example, or of course, um, electrifying port equipment. Um, Port's going to need a lot more juice in, in the future, and um, I, I'm not I'm not convinced um, the government is is on top of that, and, and those responsible for planning um, the energy uh, system are, are are on top of that. So, um, the DFT, it, the Department for Transport, in their um, their clean maritime plan, estimated that 
port demand for energy will be some in 2050 will be somewhere between 10 times 10 and 200 times what it is now so that's obviously a huge um, spectrum um, but uh, but we're, we're concerned that, um, that that's not being properly accounted for in uh, future planning scenarios. Um, next slide, please, Melissa. Um, so we, uh, as a constructive uh, association, we're always trying to look at um, solutions as well as, as, well as barriers. Um, and uh, it's, I think the one thing I'd say is that, it, I think it's pretty obvious to anyone who's, who's looked at this for more than a few seconds is that decarbonisation is not going to be cheap. Um, and I think the, we see the primary role of government is actually making sure that the costs for this um, fall in the right place or don't fall too heavily uh, on any one part of the chain um, and collapsing that, that part of the chain. So um, and, uh, as well as helping in, in the usual stuff around um, demonstrating new technologies um, and investment, investing in, in, in innovation and in research. Um, it, it, and it is starting to do that, but um, we, we, as um, Richard mentioned, we've got the Clean Maritime Demonstration Competition, but um, it's, it's 20 million pounds. It, it's great news, but it needs to be scaled up and, and that needs to be scaled up pretty quickly. So we hope that becomes a template for a, 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 much, um, a much wider scheme, a much bigger scheme, I should say. Um, so I've got there right at the top is government needs to put some investment in and I should say it's not something we we often we, we don't often go to government asking for money the industry is very proud of being um, independent of government in terms of uh, it's commercially run uh, and independently operated but um, again coming back to shore power uh, it for that example that there isn't a shore power scheme anywhere in the world we found last year um, that has um, that has been done without some level of public investment. So um, it, nowhere else, no other port in the world has managed it without some public support. Um, and it's, it's no different here, frankly. Um, more broadly, um, we want to see um, a bit of support, whether it's um, direct support or through, or through a tax, taxation system for, um, for the switch away from, from diesel to lower or zero carbon alternatives for, for port equipment. Uh, whether it's whether that's directly supporting cleaner fuels or droppings or or other transitional things or electrification itself um, and then just briefly come back to the energy systems um, something we're going to be doing uh, concentrating quite a lot on i think over the next year and, and beyond um, building on some work we've done with with national grid is uh, lobbying i think for government to properly recognize um, the uh, the demand or the future demand from the maritime sector in ports. Um, ports have traditionally been at the end of the energy network and sometimes struggle to get the power that they need. And I think it's a big opportunity with the network now becoming more distributed. Um, ports are likely to become hubs for, for renewable energy and, and, and there's, a, there's a big opportunity there. So um, we'll, we'll be um, doing a lot of work with government to make sure that we have access to, to the power um, we need. Um, and final slide, please, Melissa, I realise I'm um, going slightly over time. Um, I just wanted to flag one final thing before I, I stop is um, uh, the government mustn't, whatever they do with, with the forthcoming transport decarbonisation plan or any other work um, on decarbonising maritime ports and shipping, um, that they must recognise that um, moving freight by water is still by far the most efficient way uh, to do it. Uh, and anything, the government must be very careful not to disincentivize that or reverse modal shift, as they put it, and, and move freight off of the water and back on, on onto roads or or rail or even or even air freight. So um, anything government does, um, they have to be very careful. And, and I know they're well aware of this um, to make sure that they're looking at transport emissions in the whole, uh, and that maritime has a, a role to play in reducing emissions from other modes of transport as well. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you, Richard. That's great. Thanks very much, Mark. I'm sure that will elicit um, plenty of questions. Plenty of questions. Um, lots, lots covered in a short time. Um, so our second um, speaker is um, Caroline Price. Uh, she's the director of Green Ports at, at Royal Haskell and DHV, um, and is a specialist maritime consultant who heads up the global team um, of experts at, uh, at Haskell and. Um, and uh, spends a lot of a lot of time helping ports, terminals, and, and shipping around the world to implement changes to improve the sustainability of their option uh, operations 
Uh, today, she will talk about uh, equipment trends and planning uh, in the context of decarbonisation. Over to you, Caroline. Thanks, Richard, and good morning, everybody. Um, uh, as Richard said, I'm Caroline Price. I'm the Greenports Director at the Royal Haskonian DHD. Um, and I thought I'd follow um, Mark's excellent introduction with a little bit of a dive into what's going on on the equipment side of things. Um, a little bit about um, developing a little bit some of those challenges that Mark mentioned, specifically with respect to the kit that we use on our ports. Um, what's, what, what's the industry in terms of the development side doing to respond to some of these challenges, which of course they're doing at great speed. Um, but of course, some challenges remain, even as even as that pace of change continues. Next slide, please, Miss. So, um, as everybody appreciates, when you're looking at decarbonisation in the port sector, it's it's what we call a whole site issue. Despite um, despite that situation that Mark described around the relative differences in terms of influence and control that we might have, um, get, whether we're a port authority or a terminal operator or whatever the model might be. Um, so these four pictures here are to illustrate, I guess, the breadth uh, of opportunity, but also challenge. So it's from left to right, uh, the land estate the hinterland access options and the degree to which we work with um, parties beyond the port gates, the marine side of things, and of course, in incredibly relevant right now as, as we've seen that shift in terms of the carbon budget to now include international shipping. And of course, um, port operators and, and everybody involved in the sector has a role to play within that kind of corporate space too, in terms of how we conduct ourselves from a procurement perspective, how we engage with our supply chain, um, and there are opportunities within that too that become relevant um, as we continue on our journey to net zero and take into account all of the potential emissions um, and sort of drivers and opportunities within that. Next slide, please. So because I'm going to chat a little bit about equipment, I'm, I'm going to focus on the port estate and that's those land side operations. And if we set aside the, uh, the shipping element for most ports, um, this is where the majority of the emissions are generated. It's within that kind of land side operations piece um, uh, to do with sort of cargo handling and the storage areas. And as Mark said, historically, and indeed, as it continues to be the case for, for a lot of the operators around the world, diesel powered um, plant is still a really important part of um, our, our yard equipment and the way that we run our ports. Um, to kind of handle our cargo and, and, and keep things moving. So lots of lots of things being developed. The pace of change is incredible. And a lot of these opportunities to reduce the emissions are linked to technology, but also around the way that people um, use that technology, interact with it on the land estate um, to do with efficiency and optimization. Um, and I'll talk a little bit uh, about um, some of the options around operational efficiency, which is sort of hand in hand with some of the changes that people are looking to make with their kit. Next slide, please. I wanted to include this slide because um, I think it's useful to think about decarbonisation across, across the suite of um, the, the options that you have available to you. I think that often, uh, particularly when we're talking about funding that coming through from the government, a lot of that is focused on innovation and kind of big ticket items and fancy new things that, that you can go out and buy um, to, to, to help make some big steps on this journey to net zero. Um, but a fundamental part of decarbonisation is about optimising the energy that you already, already need and you already use. And there's lots of things that you can do within the context of what you already have um, to make the very best use of the power that you need by directing it to where you need it, when you need it, and to really focus it in on the, um, on the amount that you need at any one time. That emission, emission reduction piece that sits in the middle is what we're largely talking about today, and that's a lot connected to technology changes as well. And we can't really have a conversation about decarbonisation without thinking about the kind of the automa automation options that exist. Um, a very expensive option around decarbonisation, but it's something that we're seeing increasingly on the international stage in the port sector as people are shifting to this model to really drive those high levels of efficiency hand in hand with reducing their emissions. Next slide, please. So when you're thinking about it from the, the equipment perspective, and uh, if we're thinking around a transition, if you think of a transition model, so people are moving from um, a sort of diesel powered um, model, in thinking about how they can move forward to a lower carbon future. And there's a whole myriad of things that people need to consider when they're thinking about that. Um, Mark's touched on some of them. So timescales of availability is a key thing and delivery. As, as you said, you know, when, we, when you're looking to replace a piece of kit or um, upgrade a piece of kit, the, the timescales that that involves are not short. Um, it can be relatively quick if it's a small piece of kit, um, but if you're looking at replacing something big, then you know, you're, you're looking at something like two years sometimes to kind of get that, get that piece of kit to be delivered. 
the level of benefit that you might um, achieve with investment in a particular piece of kit is very varied. And that's, you know, in partly reflecting that, um, that diversity of technology, that pace of change, uh, what's happening in the market and how, um, and how ports around the world are responding to that. And that's kind of driving the different, the different speeds with which these things are, be, are being developed. Policy constraints can be a real issue. Um, I won't say any more about them because M Mark's articulated them so well. Um, that overlap with, with vessel side demand around, um, around the need for energy, this sort of drive towards electrification, of course, drives up that demand. And if you are also thinking about um, uh, that kind of provision of shore power potentially, or how you might support international shipping, particularly with this policy shift, um, that need to bring more energy onto site and how you're going to uh, handle it, how you're going to store it so that it can be available when you need it to meet the peaks and troughs, which we all know happen with import operations, um, that, that becomes even more of a challenge. And then, of course, there's the operational impacts and just the physical, the sheer physical requirements in terms of space, particularly if some of the supporting infrastructure is needing to change and you're therefore looking to make a transition in terms of how things are arranged on the, on the estate um, and, how you, and how your people move around within that context can be a significant challenge. Next slide, please. So having said all of that, as I mentioned at the beginning of, of my introduction, there's lots of really exciting things going on um, in the equipment world to try and respond to this drive and to help us meet this lower carbon challenge. So the shift towards electric vehicles, especially electric yard vehicles is happening quite quickly um, and has, you know, has been around really for quite a long time now because terminal vehicles don't have to travel sort of long distances on a single charge and can often use similar charging stations when they're not in use. This electrification um, option, you know, makes sense. It's rapidly being integrated, particularly, as I say, for smaller parts, including beach stackers or, or terminal tractors. And, and, and as Mark says, you know, these things are increasingly becoming relatively um, available. Um, and then also we're seeing this increase around, um, you know, alternative fuels being integrated in some of our, our yard equipment as well. So that picture that you can see there on the bottom uh, is, um, is a, a Conocrane lift truck. And um, that's sort of something that they're developing that is working on a synthetic fuel. So it's a biofuel, um, it's 100% renewable, uh, it's fossil free chemical copy of regular diesel basically. And it's primarily made up, I think, of vegetable oil and residue fat, and et cetera. Um, and it's got many of the same characteristics as, as regular diesel. And the idea is that it can be used in um, quite a lot of uh, diesel engines with limited um, modification. So they're sort of trying to respond to that need to, to transition. Um, and this is just one example of that kind of thing that's happening. I think they're trialing it at the moment and they're, they're, they're getting some pretty good results around reduction of emissions. Next slide, please. Um, I think it's it's not just it's not just on there. There are also kind of some um, options around integrating different types of energy, particularly um, renewable as well. So one of these pictures here is showing you a solar powered um, ship to shore crane. It's uh, located in Mumbai, and and they are using that kind of technology again to drive the equipment there to reduce the emissions that that they need. Hybrid and near, near zero technology is also starting to come to the fore. We're seeing that more and more often. Um, and so the bottom picture that you can see there is an RTG um, transtainer, which has got a hybrid power module within it. So um, it's a slightly different it's like it's an option. Um, and what the, uh, the idea behind this technology is that they've created essentially a, a module, you know, the engine module within the crane is, is, is developed such that as the technology changes into the future, you can kind of switch it out um, for some a different kind of um, bit of kit that will give you a power module that's completely uh, linked to zero emissions technology. Um, so we're starting to see, you know, the, the technology developers and the equipment developers responding to that uncertainty that still existed in the market and that pace of change is still happening with, with technology. Next slide, please. And then finally, as I say, just to just to touch on just to touch on automation, um, and I'm sure you'll you'll recommend many of you will recognise these pictures. That top picture there is in Rotterdam, um, where they've had automation in various parts of the port for a little while, um, and they integrate within the automated terminal at Mars Structure Two, for example, um, green energy and, and fully electrified equipment. Um, so they've got battery powered automated guided vehicles, for example, which can operate, for, I think, for about eight hours on a single charge. Um, before returning to their charging stations. Um, and then the bottom picture is in Australia, 
Uh, and this is the a picture of the first fully automated facility in, in Oz, uh, where they've kind of linked, again, all of those technologies that allow them to have high levels of efficiency and reduced energy demand um, to, uh, to enable that kind of reduction of emissions while maintaining um, or indeed delivering increased productivity. Next slide. So as I say, there's, there's lots of exciting things going on. The pace of change is incredible. Um, and the equipment uh, manufacturers are sort of trying to respond to that and to create options. It's important for them, of course, to be able to um, retain their market share or indeed grow it as, as ports have this increasing demand to reduce their emissions while maintaining operations. But I think that these are the three key challenges that stand out for me um, as I'm involved in these conversations with ports around the world as they're kind of grappling with, with how to address this. Um, that timing point is really key, not just because everything is, is continuing to change. So when you not only is there this issue around the time it takes for you to, you know, to spec a new piece of kit, to order it and then it to be delivered. You know, when you when you invest in something like this, as Mark says, that they're not cheap. Um, so you're then looking for them to have an operational life of decades. Um, and given what we know already about the pace of change, you know, there is genuine concern about the redundancy of assets if technology changes so much so in that time that it becomes perhaps not, not what you need. Maintenance is a key part of that. Um, we know we're very used to working with diesel engines. There's lots of opportunities to get spare parts. Everybody knows how to kind of replace them and do what they need to do. We know what space we need to maintain our kit on the ports. We know what equipment we need to help us maintain those kits. As the technology changes, that's really shifting quite quickly. And we need to respond to that, not least in terms of tools, but also in terms of skills within our workforce. And it finally brings me on to standardization, which is something that kind of really needs to happen, I think, to deliver those efficiencies in terms of cost for the port sector. There's still very little standardization. It's very difficult to interchange between brands and that's particularly an issue when you start to embrace digitization in, in a big way, um, where that kind of right down at the software messaging um, level, if, if you kind of have more than one brand trying to work together, it just creates massive errors that can um, cause significant problems for your operations. And that's my last slide, Richard. Thanks, Caroline. It was, that was, it was great to hear not, not only the domestic um, insight, but your global um, insight and to understand that, that real pace of change that's uh, uh, that's going to cause uh, issues, but also excitement and and, uh, and real change. Um, so now we're going to hear from uh, Leon Lakes, uh, who's the operations director of uh, Red Funnel. Um, so Red Funnel is the uh, ferry co company that uh, runs vital services between Southampton and Isle of Wight and dates back to 1820. Uh, so Liana's ferry expertise doesn't quite go about that far, but um, for over 20, 20 years, she's had uh, key roles at Red Funnel Condor Ferries and Carnival. So over to you, Liana. Good morning, everyone. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, yeah, that's quite an introduction. I'm not quite 160 years old yet, but uh, I'm feeling like it after the pandemic. Um, so yeah, I mean, we are synonymous with travel to um, between Southampton and the Isle of Wight, and we are an integral part of people's daily life, whether you're a resident, a tourist, or, or use that route for business travel. And we operate three high-speed vessels, three row packs, and one designated freight row row on that route. Um, and we're also committed to protecting the environment that we work in and ensuring that we are a sustainable and reliable operator. But there's no getting away from the fact that we are a relatively um, small company, shipping company, and, and very much you know, picking up on the points that Caroline made about the challenges we face for timing and standardization. Any investment we make represents a significant investment, a significant cost for us. So it's trying to look towards fleet replacement, but doing that in the same pace as industry and, and making sure that we are not quite ahead of the curve, but we've got things that are tried and tested. And um, because again, as Caroline said, you know, big fancy pieces of kit cost a lot of money. And for a small operator, that represents a huge risk. So our, our previous environmental strategies have, have focused on doing small things uh, that make a big difference. Um, we introduced Red Funnel Goes Green back in 2018, and that was a three-year plan that really focused on the smaller things around waste management, use of sustainable materials, energy reduction, elements of air pollution. We did run a biofuel trial at one of our vessels, the Red Falcon, but due to really availability, um, that's not something that's been viable for us to, to roll out across the whole fleet. So even, you know, like I said, smaller things, lots of them, we've looked at waste, the materials that we use, we've worked with communities on beach cleans, um, 
are biofuel trials, single-use plastics. We've reduced those over um, the last three years. But for us, it, it's really now got to be investment. And our biggest opportunity is to look at our vessels and the amount of fuel that they run. Um, if I could possibly have the next slide, please, Melissa. So we're, we're now looking to our next phase of our environmental strategy, and this will be very much to align it with the Clean Maritime Plan and obviously the UN Sustainability Goals. So for us, it's got to be about climate action and, and protecting the oceanography and the environment that we work in. So we would be very keen now to, to look to our vessels, to look to the propulsion systems for them, because that's our biggest opportunity to drive down our carbon emissions. So we operate over 33,500 crossings of the Solent a year. We're burning in excess of uh, 8,500 tonnes of fuel. We are using low sulphur, but you know it is, it is diesel at the moment. So we are due to replace, we're due to replace um, our three row packs vessels in the next five to 10 years. And our biggest challenge is around what do we replace them with? So I know we've already touched on the fact that there is, there's funding there, there's support there, but as a small operator, that's quite a risk to go out on your own and try new technology. So we are firm believers that a collaboration project between ourselves as a domestic British ferry company with a British naval arc and um, an in British engineering film ship builder is where we'll be looking. Um, it'll be an essential part of our journey as we move towards decarbonizing our operation. Um, I know bigger ferry companies are already committed, if you think of Stena, they're already committed to electric ferries by 2030 and their, their Stena Electra is out there in, for all of us to see and, and it's really interesting for us to watch how that unfolds, but due to our timing and the age of our fleet, we really need to be doing that soon. So I know that's something that we want to work with. So it's really interesting to hear Caroline's points around what is out there and, and that fast pace of change and the challenge for all of us, not only the operator as the end user, but industry in the background um, and then the ports as well. So if we were to go for electrification of our vessels, are the port then able to supply that infrastructure? I think we are now at Red Funnel in a position where perhaps we're gonna have to go with hybrid diesel electric to begin with and look to retrofit once those decisions are made. We have been involved in conversations um, with, with the port here, with industry around, will it be hydrogen in Southampton? Will it be electrification? Are we gonna to have to look at cold ironing? But those questions are not gonna be answered before we start to build vessels. So I think for me, the biggest challenge is really around that, that timing that we have, the timing piece and that standardization of what equipment is available. But um, from an operational side, that's, that's it, I'll stop there. That's great. Cheers, um, Leon. Again, um, that really sort of highlighted um, uh, some of the issues that that, that uh, 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 operators are, are facing, uh, particularly in relation to that that stakeholder engagement. Multiple parties coming together to find solutions. Um, so we're now going to move on to uh, Jerry uh, Jerry Clark. Uh, he is not only senior project manager at Portsmouth Port, but also uh, a marine pilot. Um, hence um, uh, the uniform. Um, so Portsmouth International Port first opened in 1976 uh, and is both, both owned and operated by the City Council. Um, and my conversations with uh, Jerry uh, really highlighted the sheer number uh, of measures that, that, that the port is um, both implementing and uh, uh, considering. Uh, so I said this, uh, this webinar could last 10 days. I think Jerry alone could, uh, could take up 10 days with, with, with the sheer amount of, uh, uh, of measures being considered. So over to you, Jerry, um, try and keep to time. Ah, thank you, Richard. <laughs> and um, I do recognise Liana's problem there. We've just ditched the idea of putting in a bid for a hydrogen powered boat simply because we can't find a hydrogen engine that's sufficiently advanced. So, um, yes, good morning. My name is Jerry. I'm all the things Richard just called me. I will try and keep to time. I work in Portsmouth Port and um, I drive the ships and I do project work. Ping, please, Melissa. 
Okay, why are we doing this? Well, there's a whole list of reasons. I'm not going to read them out, but principally it comes to the ownership of the port, the ownership model. We're owned by the people of Portsmouth, which in the UK is an unusual model, particularly for a successful port. And the people who own the port are represented on the port board by the councillors, and the people who own the port are the ones who are breathing the air that we're, being, we're polluting. So that's our reason for action. Ping. Okay, another reason for action, you'll have seen this in December 2020. Um, Ella Kissy Deborah, um, the coroner in London, decided air pollution was one of the reasons that this young lady died. Um, this is going to cause action amongst ports, and it should do. And one of the big things looming over us is not just nitrogen oxides, but also particulate matter. We're just starting to understand the damage that particulate matter is doing. And it's not going to be a defence in the future to say that we didn't realise or that the country's economy depends on ports continuing. We need to do something about it. Ping. OK, Portsmouth Commercial Port as it was, very relaxed, looks very good. The age of sale, that's the Camber Dock, um, no worries. Um, we, they knew what they are doing, importing Baltic rope, canvas sails, um, food, victuals, the whole lot, very simple. Then came the next challenge. Next slide, please. The Industrial Revolution, the day of, days of coal, and this is a time when the Navy was in Portsmouth. Um, this change over to coal was an existential threat. Everyone who had been working in there on rope and canvas and sail were out of a job. The port adapted. It didn't realize it was adapting. It was just doing what it needed to do to keep operating. Next slide, please. Okay, this is us now. Seven berths. Um, you can see the berths full on the row row side of it. The commercial side berths on there are empty. But our um, berth utilization is, is over 70%. We're a busy port. We have to become more efficient. And that's part of decarbonization. Next slide, please. OK, what we have to do before we can start decarbonizing, we have to understand what it is we're pumping out, what we're doing. So um, as a pilot, it was very easy for me, not, not very easy. It was simpler for me to do the carbon audit for the port for 2018, which we used as a baseline. I didn't have to do the arithmetic of the mathematics. I just got on the ship and asked the captain how much fuel they're burning at whatever speed. So it's from the horse's mouth. On that basis, we use the DEFRA guidance, which I must say is excellent. It, if you Simple sums for simple sailors, but it makes it very easy to do your carbon audit. Next slide, please. Now, here's something you can argue about for ages. Um, we bring in 50% of the UK's bananas into Portsmouth. Where do I start measuring the carbon that's being pumped out from ships? There's an argument that could say you can start measuring it from Africa or from the Caribbean where they come from, or from 10 miles out at the NAB Tower where um, the larger ships board a pilot. Uh, what I chose to do was um, do it from the fairway buoy that you see um, in red down there, the outer spit buoy. It's about four and a half miles up to the port. So we're measuring the carbon output of ships from four miles to the port. I don't know what other ports are doing. They're advised by environmental consultants. And um, I know Barcelona uses one mile from the port. And the UK guidelines, guidelines state that um, you should use that area for which you're a statutory harbour authority. Well, we're in a Navy port. So we're only a statutory harbour authority for 100 metres off the berth. So we could have a tiny carbon footprint. Uh, but we're not going to play that game. Next slide. OK, so we crunch the numbers. We use the scopes recommended in the DEFRA guidance. And in 2018, we pumped out 50,000 tonnes. And in 2019, we pumped out 60,000 tonnes. Now, this actually gives you an idea of the problem we've got in that if one uses loose language and talks about an absolute carbon reduction, then we're going to lose. That's why the word net comes in. The reason we pumped out 10,000 more tons in 2019 than we did in 2018 is because our port manager was doing excellent work and got us 844 more ships. It's what ports do. They encourage greater trade, they increase employment, and they increase the economic well-being of the area. That's what the port does. My job is to use, well, again, what the DEFRA guidance suggests, which is intensity-based measurement so that we can reduce carbon per passenger, per vehicle, per ton, or per pallet, or other sensible metric, and get more efficient as we go. Next slide, please, Marissa. 
you've got to measure, otherwise you don't know what you're going to get. Um, next slide, please. You, this again was taken from the DFT guidance on the port air quality strategy. You measure what you're emitting, you understand it, and then you do something about it. Next slide, please. We were very fortunate in that um, as a city council, we have to be very particular when we go out to tender. We put a big tender out. Well, for me, a big tender. I don't tend to have a large budget. And the person we selected was Alex Barter, Barter for Things, a local technologist and chartered engineer who's brilliant, um, has helped us immensely. Um, we did look at other air quality sensing companies, but they seem to want a lot of money just to store our data and let us use their software. Alex had already put in low power wide area network throughout Portsmouth, the Isle of Wight and to the north of Portsmouth for the water companies to measure their automated water meter readings. And what he did was put together bespoke cabinets with the necessary sensing equipment. So it really is the, the internet of everything. Um, he joins us up to our instruments. Next slide, please. Okay, what we're doing with these sensors is measuring the nitrous oxides, the sulfur, um, the carbon dioxide, but most particularly the particulates within the port. Um, we're doing this cheaply because I don't tend to get budget. I've been doing European grants since 1998. I've never had a budget. And the reason I do that is I only take items that are on the port's capital expenditure program. I then say to the boss, this won't cost you anything. I'll go over to Europe or whoever's got the money and say, can you give us some? So you line up your capital infrastructure projects with whatever the government or Europe wants to do, and you make them more sustainable. Next slide, please. That's the position of the sensors in the port. Um, the predominant wind is actually southwesterly, but that captures our emissions from our ships and our port operations. Next slide, please. Okay, we talk about sustainability. That's link span number four. It cost us nine million pounds. It's a replacement of the old one. Again, it was in the capital infrastructure bid, but I took it to Europe and using Interreg funds, we put in half a million pounds worth of sustainable measures, including um, soft start electric motors, biodegradable hydraulic fluids, special paint, special steel, and LED lighting. Next slide, please. The port terminal itself, I'm very proud of this. We got half a million pounds. Again, a, a very expensive project, but it was on the capital expenditure list. We went to Europe and we got half a million pounds for a seawater heat transfer pump that multiplies the differential between air and sea temperature 40 times, pumps hot air into the terminal in winter and cold air into it in the summer to heat and cool. The toilets are all seawater flushing and it's got air ducts on the roof to use the prevailing wind to cool the terminal so we don't have to use air conditioning. Next slide, please. Uh, seawater heat pump. I won't go through that, but that, uh, as I say, a conversion of 40 times the differential between heat, sea and air temperature. Next slide, please. This is one of the big ones for us. Our main customer is actually Okay, bringing two new large LNG ferries into Portsmouth. The picture you have there is the Glycia, which has already started. She's not LNG, but she's a Stena E-Flexer built in China and is about as, most, as economical as you can get with standard fuel oil. Next slide, please. Okay, there's measures on mitigation that we can take and we do take. What you're seeing here is quite an old fashioned idea. It's the Ringelman scale, which some of you may have used is what your local council will say if a neighbor complains that someone's pumping black smoke out. A local environmental officer will come out with that card. He'll hold it up to the sky. And if your color of your smoke is any one of those colors over a given amount of time, you can be prosecuted. Now that may sound odd in a port, but if you are trying to get more traffic in, then what do you do? Do you go to the boss and say, I don't want that ship, it's more polluting? No, you don't, because that's gonna discourage more trade. You do it at the operational level, you get your operational managers to hold the Ringelman chart up, you look at the smoke, you then get someone to go and talk to the captain and ask the chief engineer to do something about it. You do that a couple of times, and if they don't, then you exclude them from the port if you get the back end of the boss. Next slide, please. Renewable energy, um, we were fortunate enough to get an Innovate UK uh, funding of a half million pounds. We've worked with Marine Southeast, who have been fantastic. Swan Barton and the Energy Catapult. We've put in a dual fuel electric battery, dual fuel, 
dual chemistry electric battery, which is lithium iron and lead. It uses machine learning and artificial intelligence. It uses the port renewable energy and will control the distribution of energy around the port. So instead of the renewables just going straight into the grid, as it were, these can be stored and used. The idea here is that it'll be an operational management tool in conjunction with the air quality sensors. You'll be aware that Portsmouth has a clean air zone. Our intention is when meteorological conditions cause those pollutants to stay at a low level, and during times of peak car commuter traffic, we turn the port all electric, or we get the ships to come in single file, or we delay the ships. So it's incorporating intelligent use of energy with the air quality sensing. Next slide, please. Renewable energy, uh, we're putting in a massive solar array. Um, it's a little behind schedule, but what you'll see there are the plans. Essentially, we're putting solar panels on anything that faces the sun or indeed doesn't face the sun, but catches some daylight. Next slide, please. This is the energy storage system. Um, it's been put in, um, the battery is GSU ASA. They helped us with the container. It's a, it's a wonderful thing for us. We're also getting two dumb batteries and the intention is that this will control the dumb batteries. And the line here is an interesting one because everyone talks about shore power and um, both Liana and uh, Mark talked about um, the possibility of it. Well, we may have enough power within our batteries to actually power the new Roro ferries for the two hours they'll be alongside or a small um, cruise liner. We're working on that. And one of the things having been at sea and talked and worked with chief engineers is that modern ships will have a split bus bar that means instead of having to supply all the power to a modern cruise liner, you can supply the power you've got and they put on a separate bus bar their own generators. So rather than spending 10 million pounds digging holes and putting thousands of kilovolt amp cables through the port, you might be able to do it with storage batteries and sensible use of the ship's bus bar. Next slide, please. Shoreside power, the constraints, well, I've just touched on those. Um, we have put in a G99 application to the district network operator, and we are going to get 2.15 megawatts. We're going to be put up to that massive amount. A 4,000 berth cruise liner is going to take nearly 12 megawatts. So it gives you an idea of the constraints, and Liana already mentioned the constraints at the ships, at the port boundary as to how much energy you can bring in. Next slide, please. Um, and this was the Copenhagen study. It's actually available on the internet, but if you want to know how much energy a cruise liner needs, that is a very good place to find it. Um, and it certainly helped us understand what we will not be able to do. Um, well, we are going to be spending some money shortly, and indeed it's a bid on the Freeport's bid to get a study going to see how we can supply shore power without using massive um, capital infrastructure projects. Next slide, please. And this is what I've just been talking about, a modern ship, the use of a battery and topping up with the um, shoreside grid supply. Um, I am hoping I'm still working on it at the moment, but the two new LNG ferries we've got coming in in 2024 and 2025 have confirmed that they want to plug in when they get alongside. I bet they haven't told their chief engineers that, but the point here is a Roro ferry is different to a cruise liner. It should take less than half a megawatt an hour. And if it does, we can do it from our energy storage systems. Next port, uh, next slide, please. Um, fuel switch. Okay, well, we know that LNG is an interim technology. We're concerned with methane slip. Um, and we know that we go with the only options we've got are hydrogen and ammonia for the future. Um, hydrogen's not there yet, despite the fact that you can pump it into a four-stroke cycle engine. No one seems to be bringing anything into the marine arena at the moment, and I could be wrong there, uh, but nothing on a small scale that I can use. What's interesting is that we've switched part of the port to gas to liquid fuels, which is shell, um, a massively reduced particulate and emissions fuel. But interesting, in another part of the port, one of the engineers had actually started using kidney filtering technology to pre-filter out particulates, which, when you think about it, is quite massive. If, if it's correct, they're actually filtering out 67% of the particulates before they even burn the fuel. 
which begs the question, what type of damn fuel are they supplying us with? Next slide, please. And that's the filtering. That's one of our modern cranes. That's the filter unit. And if the figures that it gives are correct and they're filtering out, you will see the reduction in nitrous oxides, nitrogen oxide, sulfur and CO2 is absolutely massive. But the big one for me is the absolutely stunning reduction in particulate emissions. And again, if we are filtering out these particulates of the fuel we're being supplied, why on earth aren't the suppliers filtering it out beforehand? Next slide, please. Um, actually, that's pretty much what I've been talking about, the fuel switch. Um, I, put, <laughs> I've, I put in three bids for the clean maritime demonstration call. I've heard on the, on the quiet that I don't think I'm getting any of them, but that may be correct or incorrect. Next slide, please. And this is what I've been doing. Now, these, this is what we're doing on the port. It's based pretty much on the port air quality strategy. When you see the red, that's when you see the yellow lines. Um, you've got to understand your emissions. You've got to reflect the actions being taken to reduce them. Uh, next slide, please. And those are the actions that we're taking. Um, interestingly, when I put the carbon audit together using these three scopes recommended by DEFRA, I left out goods and services with a purchase of three and a half million on goods and services. The carbon that is a re result of that actually distorts the, the effect of measures we take on the port to reduce carbon emissions from the more operational and understandable areas. Next slide, please. Further renewables, we've got two planning consents um, or planning applications in for wind turbines around the port. Uh, these are the 38 and a half meter wind turbines. I don't think I'll get them because even if we've gone through planning, the Navy will claim defense of the realm. But we've also got a, an application in for smaller vertical wind ax, vertical axis wind turbines at less than 15 meters height above the ground. Next slide, please. Green walls. Um, you may have heard of these um, green walls. 126 milligrams per square meter of dust collected within that um, are our particulates we're concerned with. Professor Barbara Mayer has done a, a study on this, interestingly using, using magnetic wipes across the screens, the laptop screens in households to pick up the dust. Um, in a port, we're not worried about the aesthetics of having green. So the port engineer and I are looking at particulate filters more normally found in an industrial warehouse where you might be using machines, um, wood, wood producing wood dust or metal dust. Uh, so we're looking at putting a prototype around the port to pick up particulate matters because green walls rely on the rain to refresh the leaves. Um, and we don't need the port to look nice. Next slide, please. Um, same information. Next slide, please. And it's not me. Right. Thank you very much. That's me done. Brilliant. Thanks very much for that, Jerry. Um, again, absolutely fascinating and, and um, demonstrating how uh, limited resources can can, can go re really far in terms of uh, implementing measures. Uh, and also, interestingly, the use of technology to, to achieve efficiencies. Um, so I'm sure there'll be some questions um, on that. So finally, we've got um, Andy Vickers, who is the Business Development Manager at Vattenfall Network Solutions, uh, the Swedish company. Uh, so VNS designs, builds, owns and operates climate, uh, climate smart high voltage electric network infrastructure and works with major uh, electrical users and generators by adopting and extending uh, existing uh, high voltage ele electrical infrastructure. Um, so Andy's going to talk today uh, in particular about how um, uh, electric electrification of, of, of ports uh, and also vessels uh, is being uh, implemented by, by the company both in the UK and around the world. Yeah, thank you Richard and good morning everybody. So as Richard mentioned, I'm going to, in a very short time frame that we have, I'm just going to touch on um, our, our history, our sustainability journey and how we can help in decarbonizing ports. So, uh, first slide, please. Thank you. So, but Vattenfall are Sweden's largest energy company with over 50% market share. And we are one of Europe's leading energy providers. Founded over 100 years ago, we are owned and operated by the Swedish state. We have operations across Sweden, Germany, Netherlands, Denmark, and the UK. 
and we generate, distribute and supply over 130 terawatt hours of electricity from a large and growing base of renewable and climate friendly assets. Climate change is one of the greatest challenges of our time and Vattenfall aims to be a, a leading business in the energy transition through electrification of climate smart solutions. Our primary corporate goal is to enable fossil free living within one generation. This is not our sustainability strategy, it's our business strategy, and it is sustainable. Since 2014, we have increased our renewables capacity from 1.5 gigawatts to 3.5 gigawatts, and we have over 3 gigawatts of new capacity currently under construction. And since 2010, we have reduced our own overall CO2 emissions by 75%, going from 83 to 19 million tonnes but we must do more. The goal is climate neutrality for our operations, our suppliers and our customers. We call this transition to a fossil free living, our CO2, sorry, our CO2 roadmap. And recently in, in recognition of our sustainability performance, we have received a platinum award from EcoVadis, which puts us in the top 1% for sustainability in the energy sector globally. Next slide, please. In Sweden, Vattenfall are working with leading businesses to develop and deliver zero emission technology to replace traditional high emission industrial processes. Many of these projects are groundbreaking innovations that will deliver huge in environmental benefits to the world in the coming years. We only have time today to touch on a couple of examples here, but Hybrid Steel is a joint collaboration by the Vattenfall, LKAB and SSAB to produce the world's first for fossil free steel manufacturing process using green hydrogen. We are already past the experimental phases and are now building full scale production plants in northern Sweden. In cement production, Vattenfall are working with Cementa to produce climate neutral cement using green electricity. And in biofuels, Vattenfall are working with Preen using green hydrogen to power large scale production of the biofuels. Through these collaboration projects, Vattenfall are making huge investments, spending billions of our own money, striving towards our goal of a fossil free future. Next slide. In the UK, our business operations include an electrical networks business, an energy trading business, a heat solutions business, a renewable energy business. And for heavy transport and ports, we have multiple solutions to enable net zero emissions through electrification. Next slide, please. Since 2010, Battenfall have invested over three and a half billion pounds in UK renewable generation assets and will continue to invest in developing its core renewable generation assets, both in the UK and across Europe. The UK is unique in Battenfall's portfolio in that it only, it's the only country where our generation assets are 100% renewable. The map shows Battenfall's renewable assets across the country and our development pipeline projects. Today, we have over 1.1 gigawatts of wind, solar and battery storage built and operational. We currently have 240 megawatts under construction and a further 3.6 gigawatts of projects under development. Next slide, please. We have heard from the panel today that electrification is a key enabler to the decarbonisation of ports. Significant emission reductions can be achieved through the electrification of transport, plant and machinery within a, part, within a port environment. On the key side, this includes the electrification of road transport, both heavy and light vehicles, crane, tractors and other machinery, and the provision of shorter ship power to eliminate a vessel's emissions while at birth. And for vessels, this includes the conversion to all electric propulsion systems or hydroelectric powertrains. Next slide, please. We have also heard from the panelists today that the transition to, um, to net zero emissions future is far from easy, carries risk and comes with significant costs. Typical issues facing ports include local grid constraints and capacity issues. In some locations, it's just not, there just isn't sufficient capacity in the grid to electrify a zero emissions port. 
A port's existing electrical infrastructure may need significant upgrades to cope with the extra power demand of electrification. The range of current electric vehicle technology may not be sufficient for a day's work in the port or for multiple shifts. Currently, there is no clear direction from industry bodies or from government. There are multiple competing technologies for decarbonisation. Which one do you choose? Then there's the high cost of change and upgrades. What's the availability of CapEx funding? What's the potential payback and total cost of ownership? What about the added OPEX costs of owning and operating new equipment and unfamiliar technology? If the port makes these investments, will it retain its market competitive? And then there's the risk of doing nothing. What if you're left behind? Next slide, please. Vatten Fowl is uniquely positioned to offer ports green electrification solutions to its various businesses. Within the UK, we have an IDNO business. We are an independent distribution network operator. As an off-gem regulated IDNO, we, have, we can offer competitive alternative to, to your local DNO for contestable new grid connections with the added benefit of a CapEx contribution towards the project upon completion. We also have a private networks business here we invest in existing private wire electrical networks, whereby we take over the ownership and operations and take on all responsibilities for the network for a defined period of time, usually 10 years. The client pays a fixed monthly fee, locking in their OPEX costs for the duration of contract, which means that the client can focus on their core business while we operate and maintain their electrical networks. We call this power as a service. Smart microgrids are the culmination of multiple local generation assets such as wind, solar, CHP and battery storage systems working in harmony with the grid to produce a flexible, optimised local energy system which is capable of meeting the power demands of the site, independent of grid constraints and is designed to minimise grid electrical consumption and costs. Next slide please. Through our IDNO and private network businesses, Vattenfall can provide an array of turnkey solutions to help ports decarbonize. For quayside electrification, we can supply your port with green electricity for our power purchase agreements. This is a really simple, quick win that everyone can, can do today without changing any other aspect of your business. We can allocate electricity from our wind farms to your site consumption. We can deliver new grid connections and increase capacity to site. We can upgrade site electrical substations and networks. We can deliver complete shore to ship power systems. We can deliver embedded generation systems, wind, solar, battery storage systems, smart grids and energy optimization software. We can provide electric vehicle charging infrastructure for both heavy and light vehicles. And we can also deliver electric roads for heavy vehicles. And we can provide the project CapEx using our power as a service business model. And additional services for the vessel electrification include shore based battery charging infrastructure, the vessel batteries and powertrains themselves, and also the associated control and monitoring systems. Next slide, please. Here's an example of a small vessel electrification and power as a service. In 2019, we provided the investment for the propulsion system of a zero emissions electrified passenger ferry in central Stockholm. The electric ferry is designed to minimize emissions and noise and at the same, and at the same time lower OPEX costs. The ferry carries up to 98 passengers around a multi-stop to 10 kilometer route. As the world's first supercharged electric passenger ferry, it only needs to be charged for 10 minutes for one hour of operations enough for one um, circuit. Our solution, power as a service, means that the ownership, management and risk of the equipment, which includes the battery charging infrastructure, the battery system and the drivetrain, lies with Vattenfall. We guarantee the functionality of the batteries and the electric propulsion system. The client does not need to make any upfront capex investment, but instead pays a fixed monthly service fee for the term of contract. Next slide, please. As mentioned, Rattenfall is uniquely positioned to offer ports green electrification solutions through its various business units. We come from a position of strength and experience, having been on our own sustainability journey for many years. 
We own and operate a huge state of land and water-based generation assets, and we care deeply about the biodiversity and the ecosystems that we operate within, and, and we are willing to share our experiences. Vattenfall are here to make long-term mutually beneficial partnerships. Our powers of service business model demonstrates our commitment to our clients and investments for the long haul. Although we've only had a short time today to scratch the surface of Vattenfall's activities, our sustainability, our experience, and what we can offer ports to reach net zero emissions, um, if you would like to find out more, please do come and speak to us. Thank you for your time today. Thanks very much, um, Andy. So we're, um, it's now 10.41, probably got a, a few minutes um, uh, for questions if uh, if people are able to um, uh, stick around for a few minutes. Um, so uh, I'll field, field some questions. A few uh, questions have been asked in the uh, Q&A function. Um, so if you have any, have any more, uh, please send them through. Um, first one, which has is, um, is actually been answered by Jerry, but I'm, I'm not sure if that's um, uh, apparent to all attendees. So the question is, uh, has Jerry considered uh, for the port uh, generating hydrogen from electricity from solar panels, which are, are, are planned as a form of uh, energy storage? So Jerry, if you'd just like to um, sort of expand on, on, on what you said there. Yep, we're um, we're looking at putting a 35 kilowatt electrolyzer in the port, um, but not for storage. Um, I'm afraid there's if you're converting uh, sunlight to electricity, um, the use of the electricity and storing the electricity makes sense. The losses involved in converting that to hydrogen and then using the hydrogen to store means the losses involved um, are a little too great. So we are looking at generating hydrogen to power directly the land tugs that drag the containers and um, trailers off the ships, um, but not as a storage. Um, we will look to become a hydrogen hub um, using utilizing green hydrogen. Um, but again, it, it does come down to what the port needs in the future. Um, Liana mentioned earlier, we, we we know the answer is hydrogen and ammonia, but no one has those answers yet. So Brittany Ferries has moved ahead with LNG. Um, we accept that. We know there's problems with the ozone layer and methane slippage, um, but carbon reductions and air quality improvements are there. Um, so hydrogen is something we can use, but the technology is not there yet. Um, we're having to use interim. So yes, we're, we're looking at and will actively generate hydrogen. Thanks, thanks, Jerry. And just to sort of pick up on on the on the issue around the different technologies, um, Liana uh, obviously mentioned um, uh, Red Fun as sort of seeing what what other other people are doing and, and are slightly behind. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the question is, what what do you back? How do you know which technology to back? It's sort of VHS, Betamax. Which which uh, where do I put my limited resources for the uh, uh, for the payback. So um, I just wondered if uh, maybe, maybe Caroline um, could could pick up on, on that point. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a key challenge, isn't it? I mean, there's so many options and there's so there remains a, such an element of uncertainty in terms of what's what's going to be available, um, you know, in a genuinely um, workable supply and demand model that's going to allow us to operate consistently. Um, and I think that um, I think the, what Jerry's explained in terms of um, achieving that kind of transition, um, transitional space that enables them to kind of bridge, because I, I think what we're going to see and when you talk to people in the marketplace, I think that we're seeing that the, the kind of the next few years is going to be a significant time in that we're going to see some of these things kind of balance out a little bit, which will give us a little bit more certainty. It's just unfortunately for lots of operators, they, they're at a point where they actually need to make that decision sooner. So what they probably need to do is, is, is kind of um, think about some kind of transitional um, balance that allows them to reduce their emissions, perhaps through something like LNG, perhaps through a combination of different technologies, um, but create them within that uh, model um, sufficient flexibility to kind of adapt into the future. And that's, you know, one of the examples that, that I gave in my, my talk is how some of the, the equipment um, folk are thinking about this by trying to have these kind of interchangeable bits of kit that try and address that challenge. Because, of course, from their perspective, they need to respond to that too. Otherwise, they're, they're going to be looking at a drop off in business from their perspective as people are shifting to other brands or thinking about how they can move into um, a technology space that allows them to uh, um, achieve the, those carbon emissions that they need to and particularly respond to some of the policy demands that, as Mark mentioned, are going to start coming tougher and tougher as we move forward. 
Thanks, Caroline. Um, and, and also, obviously, we, we, we've, or uh, well, hopefully, coming at the end of um, the COVID pandemic, um, where businesses, ports, operators have been, been massively hit. Liana, um, I, I know it's been that's probably been your main focus over, over the last year. But when when there were limited resources for for uh, for, for for net zero considerations, I mean, how how, how could you possibly deal with all the challenges you need to deal with, Liana? Yeah, I think from our perspective, you know, we've taken a hit. Our, our five-year business plan, if you like, five-year, 20-year, 25-year business plan had us on a trajectory and along came COVID and we've we've suffered, you know, losses from that business plan. So we're now not only not sure what to invest in, we've got less resources or less cash to invest in those things. So it just makes the whole thing much more challenging on, you know, trying to determine which is the best way to go. Um, I'm, I'm totally with Caroline. I think where we are at is it's going to be... Um, probably diesel electric with a hybrid with a look to retrofit whether that is hydrogen in time or whether that is full you know battery powered option for us that's i think that's where we're going to go but that decision has to be made if we're looking to have a new vessel in five years the design um getting the ga right getting approvals meeting a yard that's a three to four year process so we really need to start soon uh jerry i mean it's clear from what, what you said jerry you, you're you seem to be uh, pretty expert at tapping into um, uh, f f funds and grants, etc. But um... but sometimes it, it 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 bites you in the butt because um, I, I built a a railhead in Portsmouth um, using funds, eight hundred thousand pounds worth of funds, and it was predicated on the regulations at the time, principally the um, diesel tax escalator. If the diesel tax escalator had stayed on, we'd be running trains. Um, this was um, going to be hitting. Um, transport by road um, but it was scrapped the diesel tax escalator so you if you're going to put money into these things you have to have some confidence that the government direction isn't going to change um, particularly when you're putting in monstrous amounts of investment as liana will be in ships so despite the fact that they're telling us it's hydrogen and ammonia um, the hybrid model that you're talking about where you get diesel with a retrofit to electric when it comes in is possibly the only sensible measure we would do at this time. In five years' time, that may be different. Um, but all we've learned, all I've learned, is that you can't rely on government guidance because it might change within a couple of years, even government policy. So we go with what's practical. And one of the things that you have to say is when people are saying shore power infrastructure will cost tens of millions, well, they're building the ships wrong if that's the case because modern ships have a split bus bar they should be able to split the electricity you can give them and supplement it with their own generators it shouldn't be an all or nothing um i think we're not involving enough the on the ground engineers for this kind of thing you're quiet Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, had to happen once. Um, we've probably got time for an, another couple of questions um, bef before we uh, end. Um, Jerry, you mentioned the, the EU and other demonstration projects. Um, so as a practical question, how does he find time, a very good question, to identify such funding and also co um, complete the applications considering cl collaborating is key and time consuming? Um, um. And it would also be useful to hear from Mark about, about uh, grants and, and um, lobbying, et cetera. Well, the answer to that is you get good people in. Um, one of the things that comes with grants is the ability to get together a consortium consisting of um, consultants who have previously got grants. Don't pay them anything and give them something if you get the grant. Um, it's an amazing way of doing things. And it is the way things have been happening now for lots of years. I've been working with the same group of small European ports for 15 years. And when grants come up, we all go in together uh, and we have a track record. I'm getting a similar thing with Marine Southeast and Jonathan Williams, um, who's doing a tremendous job um, in, we have pretty much transferred from European grants to the competitive grants that this government's putting out with Mari and Innovate UK. Thanks, Jerry and Mark. Thanks, Richard. Um, just on, on the collaboration point, um, I'll just just to say to those ports in, in on the call that uh, that is something we're we're aware of, and I, you'll be hearing from us in the next couple of weeks about some of our ideas about how we can um, help ports build better networks and 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 get those funds. But the, but the, the general point is is one we've been making, and as I said earlier, 
no shore power project has been done, for example, without public funding. Now that includes the, the one announced in Southampton and Orkney, um, but there's no established fund for that. So they've had to go out and find um, though that public money somewhere, which um, as as, as, as mentioned, it take, takes time in itself. And um, so that, that's why it's so important that government does um, have an established um, fund just for, for ports and for green maritime stuff. And that's, I think, where we're heading. But um, and one of the other points I did mean to make in, in my remarks is that if, if government isn't going to do this, that they need to tell us, because um, I, I know of a few ports already that um, I have, I'm looking at shore power. Um, they are expecting some sort of funding from government in, in the next year or so, as they've been flirting with the idea now for a number of years. Um, and if they're not going to do that, then they need to tell the industry and we'll have to make other arrangements or, or reconsider these things. But it, but not doing something, government not doing something is also holding back uh, investment and, and progress as well. So really keen to see what they come out with this year. I'll, I'll be really disappointed if there isn't uh, something in there for us. That's great. Cheers, Mark. Right, it's it's um it's ten fifty one. Uh, we've gone gone a bit over, um, but there's clearly so much to talk about. So um, I'd just like to say thank you very much indeed to all our panelists this morning for uh, this fascinating webinar. Um, it's great to see what's been done so far, uh, but clearly there's a there's a huge amount to do. Um, you know, we, we talk about what's needed in terms of innovation, support, grants, um, collaboration acro across uh, all the stakeholders and, and regulatory and financial uh, intervention. All that will be needed uh, if, we, if we're going to meet our net zero target. Um, so in the coming days, we will share a recording um, of, of the webinar and upload it to, to YouTube. Um, there's obviously a lot of um, uh, intelligence and knowledge uh, within all the, um, uh, the, the panelist organizations. Um, so if you'd like to connect with any of them, then please do get in touch with me and I'll, and I'll, and I'll connect you. Uh, if there are any un unanswered questions, I'll make sure they are answered. Uh, finally, for me, thanks to everyone who attended and asked questions. And we look forward to welcoming you to future BDB Pittman's events. Thank you.